Before we start with today's episode, I want to address a common challenge that I've noticed among HVACR professionals. They often struggle to keep up with the advancements in heat pump technologies. That's why here at the ESCO Group, along with the HVACR Learning Network, we have an amazing library of courses to equip you with the essential skills for handling today's inverter-driven heat pumps. And better yet, we're offering free access to the first two chapters of our most popular course on the fundamentals of high-performance heat pumps. Check out the link in the show notes to get your free access. Our modularity really lends well to robotics. You know, you've got all kinds of companies out there that are building robots now that can lift heavy, heavy equipment, right? I think it's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. You know, we're gonna start seeing robots doing our jobs as service technicians and installers. You know, my equipment is lend towards, uh, is, is honestly is, is great for that, right? Because of the modularity aspect, you know, but when you start looking at that, it's like, okay, well, what's it gonna look like for the service technician? What's it gonna look like for the, you know, the the HVAC business owner, what kind of skilled personnel is he going to need? All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Podcast. So today we're spending some time with my good friend, Alan Coggins. I'm glad to catch up with you. It's been a while since we've been able to chat. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me again today. You know, I love the conversations we get into because it, it just goes everywhere. And it's so it's just it's a lot of fun because we like that. We both like to think outside of the box and we both have such an appreciation for what what opportunities the HVAC industry has given us. So let's do, let's, let's do a quick recap of what the last 20 years of industry has been like for you. And let's talk about what the next 20 could potentially look like. Yeah. So, you know, I, even taking it back a little farther than that, right. You know, cause I, I'm, I got a little aged to me now, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, what did we see in our industry, right? It was, here's your furnace, here's your air conditioner. This is what you get. Don't throw a fit. Right. Here's your box. Yeah, here's your box. There it is. You know, and that's kind of what led me uh, originally, you know, thinking, look, there's got to be a better way. You know, this this thing's using a ton of whatever gas, electric, you know, the whole nine yards. And that's what kind of got me thinking outside the box, too, you know, was was just, hey, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. And of course, that led to our development of the cocoon. And we have um, really breaking the mold uh, in regards to what conventional HVAC has been. You know, here's your box. You know, that's it. Yeah, we have a box, too. Uh, but our, you know, the components inside the box are a lot different compared to what you're normally getting. And the way that our furnaces and the way our equipment uh, and everything runs is a lot different as well compared to conventional HVAC. And so, you know, like our customers, they rave about the savings and they raise about the comfort, right? And, you know, if you really think about that, energy savings and comfort hasn't gone hand in hand in many, many years. It's been, it's been lopsided, up or down, right? One or the other. Yep. And therein lies what we have been bridging that gap. You know, people love the comfort and they love the, uh, the energy savings that they're getting from our equipment. And so being a guy from the trade as well, you know, spent, you know, 25 plus years, you know, in the field. Uh, as a balancer, service tech, installer, the whole nine yards, you know, this was, you know, <laughs> this wasn't just a furnace, some guy getting out of engineering school going, oh, hey, yeah, I can make that better. No, this furnace has been made by us, you know, and really for us. Um, you know, if you think about our equipment, you know, it's very modular, it breaks down. You know, I've got two bad discs in my back from the trade, you know, <laughs> Um, a being a little young and dumb and, and B, you know, biting off a little more, you can chew, of course. Um, but then, you know, I said, you know what, we got to, th there's a better way, you know, and, and so that modularity, we're able to break our equipment down and keep it, you know, to where it's safe for the workers, you know, that they go and install, they're not going to be having the issues like that, you know, that we'd seen in our time, you know? Um, and so that's, that's just kind of one thing, you know, as far as like with the equipment. And not to mention, you know, the controls and everything really haven't changed. I mean, it's been, again, get what you get, don't throw a fit, you know. Oh, here's your stat, you know. I mean, yeah, some of the stats have changed, all that, and you get a little bit more smart, if you will, from it. But, you know, we're building equipment that uh, is not just smart from the stat, but it's smart from the equipment. You know, we're writing control algorithms to get the best efficiency and all those kinds of things, you know. And so really when I stop and I look back, what it was, how the gaps, you know, or the bridges that we've been able to build to, you know, get across those gaps, you know, with equipment to technician to homeowner, um, you, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of different benefits to the equipment that I originally didn't plan on. And not just that, but how about this? You know, the, the one of the other great benefits here, and I, I'm just going to get a little bit political, 
Okay. Uh, you know, President Trump just announced we're going to Mars. Right. Right. And I have said for years, if you remember on that first podcast you did, you know, it's been my dream to put a furnace on the moon or on Mars. And I really finally think that this is an opportunity now that, you know, we may have, I may be able to get that dream done. Hmm. Um, you know, and actually the picture that I sent to you, uh, that you have there, you know, I, I went to Grok, you know, on X and I said, Hey, you know, make this picture up because hmm. when we start thinking about this and we start heading to the moon or we heading to Mars and we're going to actually put people there and they're going to stay there. I mean, how are they going to be comfortable? Exactly. You know, not just that. I mean, you know, let's face it, all mechanical things have problems, right? And when you have a problem, you know, it, it, you got to get it fixed now. This this reminds me of, of one of my trips in which, you know, I've just been up into the Arctic and in the Arctic Circle. I was in the subarctic regions, you know, um, up in Yellowknife and uh, Northwest Territories and uh, the Yukon uh, up to Nunavut into a town called Akalawit, which is up there in the Arctic Circle region. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're dealing with temperatures of like negative 40, right? Yeah, pretty crazy. most. Most of us here in the lower 48, I mean, we, we don't get that, yeah. right? Oh, I mean, on, it's not going to work up there. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, actually the uh, Arctic Energy Commission uh, just said no, no to heat pumps because heat pumps do not work up there. Even your, your variable speed, all that stuff, they just don't work. What I was getting at, though, is that it really kind of reminded me of like, hey, you know, you got to have redundancy built in. If we're heading to the moon or Mars, if there's a problem, not if, when there's a problem, doesn't matter. It's everything great. mechanical breaks at some point. Well, you got to have redundancy. You got to have backup. You got to have time. Right. In the Arctic, when they, when they hit negative 40, they've got an hour to get everything fixed before that house freezes up. Oh, an true. hour. You know? Um, and so when you really look at that, you look at the challenges that some of the people face around the world. And let's face it, you know, as a, as a service guy, you know, I stayed in my truck and I stayed around the St. Louis area. And, you know, that's all I did. Right. I didn't look at anything beyond that, you know, because I was here, you're in the muck of it, you know. The, this is what makes my payment. Exactly. Be here. Right? Yes. Yeah, this is how I put food on the table, you know. Um, and it wasn't until later on, you know, that I actually started kind of like, you know, hey, I don't just want to be good in my trade. I want to excel in my yeah. trade. I want to be all I can be, be the best I can be. You bet. And that's what, you know, when you really start looking out and you start going, okay, how are other people around the world you know, taking their comfort, taking their energy usage, you know, all those kinds of things. That's when it really, you know, the light bulb's able to turn on. You start to, you know, think about how can we do things different. Hmm. All right. So well, let's think about that, right? Most people are, most technicians, contractors are used to thinking about a heat pump or a gas furnace, something that's using energy that is uh, almost demand response, right? I'm going to use this energy to do something with right now. And unfortunately, you know, energy is not consistent. Uh, it's, it's easier to produce at some times than others, especially if we have light, right? If we have the sun's out, we've got energy being produced. When it's not, we have very little energy. And so if we start thinking in the future and we start thinking about you know, what our industry could look like going forward, what our industry could look like if we were to stay on the moon for a period of time, if we were to stay on Mars for a period of time and have a reduction in the amount of moving parts. Well, what if I want that down here? on earth right now. That's right. Well, let's think outside of our traditional box and let's think of ways that we can do that. And that's really what you've done. You've moved into manufacturing something that challenges our traditional way of using energy. So let's talk about that and how it would work in future environments. Well, you know, we got a couple of different um, solutions to that problem, right? So storage. Storage is a big thing. You know, right now with conventional equipment, there are no storage, no. you know, nothing, you know, there's myself, you know, we're doing some storage, you know, in the furnace itself. Right. So, you know, our duty cycle, you know, the furnace runs, you know, it heats up and then the blower motor kicks on after the heat up one to three minutes and it runs till the thermostat's satisfied. And because we have those thermal plates in there, right. You know, big hot rocks. Yeah. Uh, you know, those, those, they hold heat for a long time. And so we're able to, once that thermostat's satisfied, shut the power off to the heating panels and reduce that blower motor speed and keep that heat coming into the house on a degraded rate, you know, which means you're not going to overshoot the thermostat, all those kinds of things. So you got that storage just in the furnace equipment alone that other conventional equipment doesn't have. And the other thing that we have now too uh, is we have an actual thermal storage system. So think about a car battery. A car battery stores electrons, right? 
and we store sensible heat is what it comes down to. So uh, we've kept the modularity aspect behind it all. And, you know, we can add two, three heating chambers, heat them up to 800 degrees. And we're able to keep that, you know, that power there for four to six hours. Wow. So when you really start looking at that, why would we do something like that? Why would we build like that? Well, here in Missouri, we're very spoiled, right? You know, we don't have peak energy, energy demands. Exactly. Uh, it's elsewhere throughout the world, you know, that's going to have that and out the country too. Um, and so what happens is you go from like, you know, say 10 cents a kilowatt hour up to, you know, 95 cents a kilowatt hour or something ridiculous. Well, the whole idea there is that, hey, we're pulling off of this sensible heat during those peak times, right? You know, that same kind of stuff we're going to need in space. We're going to need on Mars. We're going to need on the moon. You know, not only do we want to produce or, or in store as much energy that, you know, we can, because again, much like those people in the Arctic are facing, you know, you, your system goes down, you've got minutes, you know, an hour maybe, you know, to get it fixed before you're in some real trouble. Exactly. And so I think having the redundancy, having the storage, having all those things, if you really get right down to it, this is not only good for every home and, in, in, you know, and in, in space, if you will, it's also good for our national security. You know, when you stop and you take a look at what, what has happened over in Ukraine, and Russia targeting infrastructure and everything else. And now you've got millions of people, you know, without heat, without power, all those kinds of things. Um, I think it really is going to come down to a point of, you know, A, just for if there is a natural disaster or war, you know, God forbid a war or anything like that, well, then you're covered. You know, you, you've, you've got backup to a backup. You've got, you know, it, you've got that energy independence if you sit on one side of the aisle or you got that sustainability if you sit on the other side of the aisle. That's a good perspective. Yeah. You know, and I keep trying to tell all the politicians, stop arguing. They're one and the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to, you know, defeat, you know, the, the whole global warming thing or anything like that. You know, yeah, maybe it's our planet going through changes. Maybe we caused it, whatever. Uh, you got to be smart about this. And I really feel like the last administration was not there. You know, they, they tried to take a hammer you know, and just make everybody do, you know, bend to their will. You're going to cut this out. You're going to do that when you got to be sensible about it and be smart about it. You, you cannot go through a transition overnight. You know, the old saying, Rome was not built in a night. Well, if you want a more secure, you know, uh, power grid, you want all of these things, you got to do them in steps. And, sure. and I, I think that's, that's what we're seeing. I think that's where we're, we're heading to as well. Yeah. And, and I agree on that. And I was actually sitting in on a very interesting conversation led by um, University of California, Berkeley a week or so ago. And the, the professor that was, that was given the lecture, given the conversation, you know, specialized in energy management and understanding cost of energy around the country. And one thing that I did not realize is, you know, we talk about these large solar fields, and yeah, you know, they're phenomenal pieces of energy investment into our grid. I didn't realize that in areas around solar grids, there are times during the day that peak energy cost wholesale is negative. And I went, oh. wait a minute, because we're producing more than we can transfer at certain times. Well, think about that. If we started relooking at heating and cooling, particularly in the heating season, and we were utilizing storage at those peak low rates, we can actually have that benefit of extended heating times with lower energy costs. We're already seeing that in places around the country where we have, take for California, it's got like five different energy prices per day. And so they're encouraging, you know, people giving discounts on rates to be able to charge EV vehicles at certain times of the day or night. And so they're setting up clocks or setting up, you know, programs to be able to manage uh, charging during those lowest price times. Well, if we think about that from a heating solution and we actually had a surplus of heating capability because we purchased it at a lower cost and we need it at night when it's at its highest cost, potentially, you know, in the time frame where it could be potentially the highest, we really just made a very wise choice, both environmentally and financially. That's right. And, you know, I, I think doing things commonsensically, right? You know, that's yeah. the common sense isn't just handed out, apparently. Right. right? You know, and, and to me, that's that's what makes it, you know, smart. And that's what makes it, um, you know, the way to go. Right. You know, I mean, it, really, if you look at it, we right now, all conventional equipment is bound to one source of energy. If you get right down to it, 
Uh, and that's the reason why we also do, um, you know, power systems as well, you know, on a, on a small scale, but we're doing power systems. So think about it this way. You know, we've got the grid. We can't let go of the grid. You know, a lot of people, you get a lot, oh, you know, the grid, 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 you know. No, you can't let go of the grid. You know, that's just ridiculous. We'll be back in the dark ages. Yes. Um, but okay, so like here in Missouri, a lot of our uh, power is made by coal, you know. Um, well, guess what? You know, there are certain times of the day that, hey, you know, the sun is shining here. And, and just like Mark Twain said, you don't let the weather in St. Louis wait five minutes. You know, it does change. And we'll get all seasons in one day, you know. I think I still got four inches of ice out there from, you know, a, a storm two weeks ago, but, you know, um, but, you know, so when you think about it that way, it's like, okay, you've got the grid. Now, if we can implement some sort of solar or some sort of wind, maybe even a backup generator or something, you know, to where, you know, don't forget energy cannot be created or destroyed, only changes from one form to another. And of course you've got loss in that change, but when, as things get more efficient, as you continue to mitigate that loss, um, now multiple sources of energy really make sense. I mean, it, it wasn't, but maybe 10 years ago, I guess it was, we had one heck of an ice storm here in Missouri. And, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of people without power in the middle of the winter. Right. And yes, we had some deaths. We had, you know, all those kinds of things, you know, um, but that, you know, even back then it was like, okay, we can't just be holding to one, right. You know, We've got to make energy efficiency. We've got to make more forms of power, solar, battery storage, wind, you know, thermal storage, uh, all got to be more uh, cost effective, you know, to really have a, a big impact. And so when I, when I stop and I take a look back of what the, you know, what the industry was, you know, 20, 30 years ago compared to what it is today, it has changed quite a bit. Drastically. And, and that's where, you know, listening to Trump saying, hey, we're going to Mars, you know, which pretty excited about that. <laughs> um, where are we going in the next 20 years, right? What's it going to be? And that's when last night, you know, I was thinking about uh, our meeting today and our conversation here. And I thought, you know, our modularity really lends well to uh, robotics. You know, you've got all kinds of companies out there that are building robots now that can lift heavy, heavy equipment, right? Um, I think it's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. You know, we're going to start seeing robots doing our jobs as service technicians and installers. Um, you know, my equipment is lent towards, uh, is, is honestly, is, is great for that, right? Because of the modularity aspect, you know, but when you start looking at that, it's like, okay, well, what's it going to look like for the service technician? What's it going to look like for the, you know, the HVAC business owner? Um, what kind of skilled personnel is he going to need? You know, not only I think are the HVAC trades going to need to be, yes, you know, um, you know, taught HVAC, you know, till the cows come home. Uh, but they're also going to need to be taught robotics too. You know, how is this robot running? How is all this? And I, I think, you know, yeah, in 20 years, I, I'm not going to be a bit surprised when there's going to be a robot or two or 10 at an HVAC contractor's place. You know, uh, if you look at what's happening in manufacturing, we can utilize these to uh, manufacture our systems as well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Nissan and some of the other big companies are already doing it. Tesla has them uh, out there. They're doing it. And when you think about that, you know, we as technicians and, you know, installers and everything, we're going to have to show up to work, not just ready to put in an HVAC system and go service it. But I think it's going to be more than that. You know, in, in 20, 30 years, it's going to be you got to show up. You got to know how that system goes in and you got to make sure those robots do it right. And I think that's that's what we're going to see in 20, 30 years. I do too. All about adapting to technologies and staying aware of changes as an HVAC instructor. I agree that we should be looking at our new technologies and incorporating those into the classroom now to be, you know, prepare for things that we will see in the future. And I see as uh, energy storage as a very significant part of what we do as an industry. And I look forward to see more from Cocoon and Alan Coggins. Alan, we sure appreciate you being here. Encourage everyone to go over to cocoonrevolution.com. Take a look at the innovations coming out of there and keep an eye on new things coming 